A warm welcome to Sibele Zulu, HR Director, Mondelez International. You make Cadbury and Chappies. Uh, it's very good. Yeah, we don't bring any chocolates. Don't ask me for them. <laughs> oh, what a pity. And Lorette Makubele, HR Director, JTI, and Mars Manchi, the new Head of Resources as of Monday, I believe, <laughs> at Alexander's yes. Forbes Investments. A warm welcome to you ladies. Thank, Thank you, you very okay. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sabine, do you want to tell us about your experience in Africa, some of the projects you've worked on, countries you've traveled in, just the general, what's your experience been in Africa? It's been uh, quite an interesting um, experience. I started um, traveling outside of the country uh, into Southern Africa mostly in 2007, actually, um, going to countries um, like uh, Namibia, um, Swaziland. Sorry, is, can you hear? Is there sound? Is, uh, Help, please. Is the mic, mic on? Um, not sure. Is that better? No. <laughs> okay. With our technical guy. Can we use that one? There we uh, go. I'll, I'll just use this in the meantime. Thank you, thank you, Laurent. Um, so, yeah, I was saying that I started um, going outside of South Africa around 2007, um, doing various projects with uh, private as well as government um, entities, actually, um, in countries like Namibia, Lesotho, uh, Mozambique, which was really interesting from a, um, a language perspective um, back then. Um, and then went further up into Rwanda, uh, Nigeria, um, Egypt, um, Kenya. So that's been my experience over the years, um, working on different roles. The first one was um, consulting. Um, and then with my employment with Heineken, I worked a lot more closely with HR um, um, leads in the different countries and worked on talent and leadership um, development projects, which were really interesting. And I'll, and I'll share some of my experiences when it comes to talent and leadership um, later on. Great. We look forward to hearing about that. All right. Hi. Hi, everyone. So I started working in Africa at around 2009 also started my career in the SADC region um, in an insurance industry at the time um, and uh, then moved on to a consulting firm where then it was just the rest, the whole of Africa uh, being responsible for it um, and my current company now, we are a tobacco company and I look after the South, East and Central Africa region. So that's about 24 countries in, uh, 20, yeah, 24 countries overall. 24 countries, wow. Hi everyone, um, so I basically started my HR experience in the rest of Africa, uh, which was quite interesting, fresh from varsity, completely thrown into the deep end, no special training, uh, most importantly no one to even guide you through what the expectations are when you are setting up office, um, especially not in your local country where you understand your local laws. Uh, so I really had an interesting start into my HR career. I was working in West, East Africa, as well as SADC region. Um, I happened to be in a very interesting entertainment-based uh, organization. So I got to do a lot of high-volume, pressurized work. Think about the most interesting piece of HR work you've had to do. I've covered that in the HR space. And think about the worst kind of menial task you've had to do in the HR space. I've also had to do that, and I think that's kind of the breadth of the HR experience I have, particularly in the rest of Africa, is that I've had to set up office where there's no HR uh, skill set and or an HR uh, presence, and to kind of sell that to the business, um, to, to, to sell why the function is so important, uh, and then also to get to do the fun, interesting things in HR that we get to do along leadership development, uh, talent management. So it's really been a very well-rounded um, experience, uh, b particularly between East and West Africa. What do you, uh, thanks, that's great to hear. What do you think are some of the, the lessons from an HR perspective that South Africa can learn from other countries, from what you've seen? In my experience, I've always felt that the businesses that, that uh, I worked for, the organizations I worked for, the rest of Africa space was always open to 
um, experimenting within the HR space. So I've often found I'm headquartered in Johannesburg um, and if I want to roll out a particular HR strategy or a particular HR initiative, I, I felt that rest of Africa was more open to test it, play around with it, see what works, what doesn't work, and then from there kind of customize, which is very important, customize per region. And I felt that's kind of where I got a lot of um, presence um, and exposure and a lot of quick wins because you can say in this country this is what worked brilliantly and then kind of customize to the next region. Mm. So really I see you. Lorraine. Thank you. I think uh, that's I think that's a very good point because I find when when South Africans go into other countries, we are already looked at with a little bit of apprehension. You know, they they're not sure what we're coming with or the arrogance sometimes they associate with with us. So it's about just having that humility to know that you are not at home. So you know people say, welcome, feel at home. No, you're not at home. Just take some time to actually figure out what this country's nuances are about, what the culture is about. You know, so because sometimes we would criticize people for lack of agency, for not being outspoken. Meanwhile, the whole culture is really about them not being that way. Um, so it's about, so I think the challenges have been about just move slow to move fast. Good advice, Lorette Tavilia. I see you nodding. <laughs> I am. Um, is my mic working now, guys? Is it? No. Yes? No? No. no. <laughs> Mr. Tech, you sort me out, please. Is it working now? Thank you. I feel sabotaged. <laughs> <laughs> no um, cat breeze for you, definitely. <laughs> I think for me, um, th there's this thing that as South Africans we have to stop. When we go to other countries in Africa, we like saying we're going into Africa as if we come from some other place, right? First of all, we are in Africa. So going into Africa is very strange because you are already here. In so Africa. we take that kind of mentality when we go into um, other countries and, and we almost look down on, 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 on the rest of the continent because we are South Africans and sometimes we have a bit of a know-it-all attitude. I think if we can realize that the continent is very diverse, um, it, South Africa is not the, the, the beat and, and, and all of, of Africa, right? There's, there's people that are much more advanced, much more educated, if you want to call it that, much more well-traveled in the continent that have a lot to offer us as South Africans. So I think first of all, the, the notion that it's a different place, it's, it's, it's an inferior place, we need to dispel that. I think that is how we are denying ourselves of the opportunity to learn from all of the um, uh, uh, other people that we share this continent with. Um, I think the second thing is we are so used to things working relatively well in our own country that when we go over, we then expect things to also work the same way they do here. When I travel, I completely remove all of my preconceived ideas and my expectations. I go in and I experience Nigeria for what it is. I don't make comparisons that, oh, you know, the, the, the airport, um, for those of you who've been through um, uh, the, the, the airport uh, in, in Lagos, it's Lagos, it's not Johannesburg. So unless you start seeing Nigeria for what it is, seeing Kenya for what it is, you will always be walking around comparing, making comparisons with, with, with South Africa. And I think you will not learn anything from the continent if that's what you do. So when I travel, I forget that I'm South African. I go in and I experience the food. The people in this room will eat sushi with no problem. But when they go into um, some of the African countries, the food is looked down upon. How else are you going to appreciate the continent and the people uh, and their experiences if you don't immerse yourself in the culture? So that's my approach and that's what I do when I travel. That's I will very go to advice. the very remote part of Lagos or Rwanda and I will actually try out the local cuisine, try and learn a few of the local words. I mean, I've forgotten a lot of them, but try and understand where people are coming from and not bring my South Africanness into um, um, somebody else's space. That's I totally great agree. advice. I totally agree with uh, Kabile there. And that's also been part of what 
what I can say as you know, experiential learning and in as far as sharing our experiences in, in rest of Africa. And that's why I specifically say rest of Africa because I'm acknowledging <laughs> that we are also, we are in Africa. Um, and, and like you're saying, South Africans, as South Africans, we tend to forget that. Um, for, for you to achieve, as an HR professional, to achieve success in rest of Africa, you do need to immerse yourself in the culture, in what locally is, you know, the touch points or the hot spots of what's happening locally, because then how else are you going to provide an HR service offering that speaks to locals when you don't actually understand, you know, what their pressures are politically, socially and otherwise. Um, so you're only going to be able to add value if you start immersing yourself and, and understanding uh, particularly the environment that you're operating in so that you can succeed. I also found that in terms of getting buy-in um, from the locals, once you understood what they were going through, once you understand and shown an interest, a genuine interest in their country, um, then buy-in comes very easily because they don't see you as the South African that's coming to tell them how to do things. They actually see you as part of the team. If I may add, uh, just a little word of caution though about being prepared to go into whatever country you're going into. One of the things I do, um, especially if I've never been there before, I do go to my travel clinic and make sure that I have checked all the health risks and if I'm up to date with all my immunizations, that's important. And secondly also, I know some companies, especially some multinationals, are very on top of their game as far as to, when it comes to um, security alerts and health alerts and all those things, follow up on those and read up on them. But also if you are not in one of those, because I've also been in a company where we were just getting into those countries and we knew nothing about looking after ourselves, looking after our experts, and it was trial and error, which is great, but it's, it's, it's stressful as well. So do follow up on that and don't take it for granted. And for me, it's, it's, a person, it's very personal for me because I, one of my friends lost their mom from malaria. She was very well traveled and it happens to all of us. You know, the more traveled you are, you start taking some of those notices for granted. Um, you start relaxing on your sprays and your pills and whatever. So please don't forget that. I know sometimes then, you know, okay, now I've been for, in this hotel for the 15th time. I think I know already. But something does happen. And for me, I would hate to lose anyone else that I know or even that I'm responsible for because I got relaxed in some of these things. And I can imagine that's very, very important. On the subject of challenges, what are some of the challenges that you've experienced while working in, in the rest of Africa? <laughs> if I may. Okay. You, you may go Th thank ahead. you. I, I think it's just that, that the, their experiences have been very different. And also depending on what kind of country they are in, you find that for us, you know, because we are more... The, our environment uh, challenges us to be far more prepared. You know, our winters are so different from our summers, for example. So you know that in winter you must have your coats and your jackets, whereas other countries where the, you know, the climate is similar all year through, their approach is also kind of like that, like tomorrow is another day. Um, and another day. So you find, like, if you go to a country like maybe Sudan, um, you know, maybe the um, resources, from a resource point of view, you'll find that the skill sets that you're going to come across there are not what you are used to. Um, and the IT resources, you know, sometimes, like, you'll find in a country that the Vodacom or MTN network will just shut down for a few hours. You can imagine if it happens here, there'll be chaos. I mean, yeah. they'll never recover <laughs> from that. But in those countries, it, ha it happens. Sure. So I think it's about also you knowing that I now need to think on my feet, be a little bit relaxed about things that really, really don't, uh, you can't, you've got no control over. Um, but also just working with what you have in a way that's going to work for everyone and not just yourself. Yeah. Mm. I, I think for me, the, is my mic working? 
I must, I must start with that now. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I think for me, the, the technology um, has been one of the biggest challenges. Um, when I was doing um, the, the regional role that I did uh, um, for Africa Middle East, I would have a, 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 a conference call that was supposed to be 30 minutes, but it would last two hours because you keep getting cut off and cut off and cut off. It's nobody's fault. It's just the infrastructure is not as advanced as we are used to. I know we always complain about our calls being dropped by MTN or Vodacom. Believe me, if you haven't tried to have a meeting with DRC um, and, and you've managed to have it in the allocated time, then you've been lucky. So that teaches you a lot about patience. I mean, I found my patience was really, really tested because it's not the person's fault on the other side of the line. It's just the way that things are. So you have to plan your work around that. Always build a buffer into the meetings that you are scheduling. I think the second one was language. Um, I think as South Africans, we take for granted the importance of understanding either Swahili or French. I know how we feel about colonialism, but fact of the matter is that half of the continent is uh, 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 francophone, so um, it's French speaking. And if you cannot speak French, I was not able to train in the DRC because I don't speak French. That meant for my employer, they have to bring two people to the training. So I'm there as supposedly the subject matter expert, but I cannot deliver the material because the people I'm talking to don't understand. So that's a challenge for HR professionals to think around all of those challenges. When you're hiring, maybe what we need to be looking for is something different than what we were looking for 10 years ago. We're looking for people that are multilingual, that have worked across cultures so that they are able to, um, um, to adapt. And I think the last one has to do around um, the challenges of finding talent. Mm. Talent is there. Even in South Africa, we have enough talent. The challenge is our um, innovation and creativity when we're looking for talent and knowing where to look. So what worked for me was networking extensively. Whenever I was in a different country, I've got friends in Egypt, I've got professional friends in Egypt, professional friends in Kenya, in Nigeria, so that when I need something and I need to find a specific skill, I call someone and I'm saying, okay, I'm looking for this, help me navigate your country because I obviously don't know what's going on. And I think this thing of staying in your hotel and not really going out and exploring, it's not only about making social connections, but professional connections as well that will help you with your challenges um, uh, uh, of, of the job that you're doing. And I think it broadens your horizons. I also really like your previous point, absolutely immerse yourself in the local culture. It gives you so much better of a feel and a taste and an appreciation for the place and it makes life much more interesting. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. On that point, I was going to ask you about, Marge, your yes. balance between your local and expats within yes. your organization, because I think the local, the local content is absolutely key. Yes, so, and that's, that would be form part of what my challenges were, trying to get that balancing act correct. Because once you are locally in office, you immerse yourself in what's topical, what's urgent, what's required, and then you still need to report back to head office, to headquarters, which headquarters has its own sort of set agenda, and now to meander through those dynamics and those politics, I think once one can cross that bridge, you find from an HR point of view, your, work, your workload is much easier. So it's really also about just being politically savvy, uh, making sure that you do maintain that balance because after all you do report to headquarters and then at, at the same time you have a matrix reporting to local office which also has its own sort of you know set agenda that you need to make sure that you're keeping both parties actually um, incredibly happy at all of the times so that actually tends to be for me that was my, my bigger challenge was being very junior and having to navigate uh, through the dynamics, through the politics, uh, making sure that everyone that needs to be happy is happy. Um, so that's, that, was, that, that would stand out to be my main challenge. Just also on the challenges, Anike, on a personal and a social note, um, going back to what, the, what you said, I think, for example, in Lagos and the driver doesn't stop at a stop sign, don't fret about it, don't stress about it. Look the other way and move on with your life. Um, and also the realities of, uh, of traffic, um, you know, and 
it's, it's been quite interesting starting back, because I also started back in 2005, 2006 in rest of Africa space, um, how I used to bitterly complain about traffic in rest of Africa, how getting from one office location to the next would almost take me half my morning and I'm already like two to three hours late for my meeting because I didn't know any better. I didn't know it was going to take that long um, to cover a very short uh, commute. And then now it's such a reality in Santon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Thanks, the other thing about, and f please forgive the generalizations, right? Mm -hmm. But the one thing about us South Africans, we love to complain, right? <laughs> Yesterday we were complaining about the heat, then we complained about the rain, today we we're complaining <laughs> about the cold, nothing's ever good enough. But also when we get to Africa, it's the same thing, we criticize. So if I'm in DRC or Angola, I know they speak a different language. Um, so the concierge, when you call, they'll speak in English, reception will speak in English, the person they sent to your room won't speak in English, will have zero understanding of what you're talking about. But that's also the same if you go to Geneva. So just give them a break. You know, some of these things really, it's not the end of the world. Because I think sometimes we just criticize Africa to the umpteenth degree for no reason. Definitely. Any more advice or ideas? You've given some, some, some great input and some great, I mean, I love the comment around integrating with the locals, uh, the preparations that you need to do, uh, integrating, more tips for HR professionals who would like to travel up in Africa and for whom it is important for the organizations to be successful in Africa. I think for me what would stand out is have an open mind. Um, and having an open mind socially as well as professionally. So again, locally you may have systems and processes that work brilliantly because you then don't have bandwidth issues and then you find in rest of Africa that's obviously going to be your first and primary challenge. So it really means also as an HR professional you need to think on your feet um, and be able to adapt to whatever the status quo is. So today the system is working, tomorrow it's not working. The show must continue and the show must go on. So for me it's really um, given me that depth and breadth in my, in my experience because I've prepared to run with a particular project in a particular manner which I've packaged when I was in South Africa and now I'm in Tanzania and I'm trying to roll out and it's not particularly working according to my plan. It's really about thinking on your feet and adapting when the need arises. Uh, one is, so sometimes it's not about us as HR people, right? It's about the experts you are also sending to those countries. So the advice is choose the right people to go into those countries. Because um, Africa, yes, it's not, each country is different. So people need to also not just be very brilliant at what they do, but they also need to be street smart as well, so that they can actually immerse themselves into those cultures. It doesn't happen automatically. Someone like me, I'm an uber introvert, right? It's never, I'm never going to ever walk out of my hotel room all by myself and say, I'm going to. I'm going onto the streets now. So I'll need someone to kind of guide me, which is also okay. But then know that when you're sending someone out there who is leaving their family, their friends, everything they know behind to go immerse themselves into that culture for a year, two or five, that they'll need a different kind of support from you. And they don't need, sometimes we come across as arrogant and jealous, like why must I give that person all those benefits? It's hard, it's a hard call that you're asking them to do. So just let them be and then do it and support them in a way that's meaningful. Um, because being an expert in a different country is very difficult. Absolutely, and engagement is at the heart of it. You know, to be yeah. successful, you want your people to be happy and engaged and positive. And so you have to get those things right, and there's not a one size fits all. No. There's definitely not a one size fits all, but I think last words from me, particularly for HR professionals, um, would be to really look at um, cultural intelligence um, as, as one of the key skills or competencies that we have to build in the people that we are sending out. What you don't want is someone having to come back because they were unable to live with people that have a different culture or that see things differently. And I'm not saying people must accept what is happening. So I'll give a short um, um, story. We, I, I traveled through Zambia, this is many years ago, 
and at the uh, airport, they told me that my passport was missing pages, so I couldn't go through. Of course, my passport had all the pages, but I was young and I was confused, and I was like, what are these people talking about? And I paged through my passport, and they said, Madam, move, 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 because they needed to let people through, and they can see that I'm clueless. Um, and what that meant, I needed to have a $20 note put in the passport so that I could go through, right? Now, had I been, you know, um, had I not gone through some kind of ethics and integrity training, I was so terrified in a foreign country, I probably would have paid it out of fear. But I understood that, okay, I'm going to stand here until someone tells me what's going on, even though someone was telling me, Madam, don't you have $20? They'll let you through. Took me about three hours waiting at the airport. Eventually, I was let through because I just pleaded ignorance. But when you're sending people out, understand that what we are able to complain about and put on social media that happens with the traffic officers or at the airport, nobody cares about that in the middle of Lagos. You can complain until we are blue in the face. It, it, you're just going to be frustrated. And um, the last thing for my um, white South Africans, um, the queue doesn't exist in most of the African <laughs> countries. So please stop stressing and complaining and blowing a gasket because nobody cares about you. Take the cue from us and just chill. <laughs> so when you go out, please chill. Understand that the people are different um, and, and remove your preconceptions of what it's supposed to be like and, and be present and, and, and be in the moment. Um, and then finally, on the issue of experts, I think as HR professionals, we have a challenge that we are very accepting of this European notion that we don't have talent and therefore experts must keep coming to, to, to Africa and we don't see the same outflow of, of Africans into Europe, right? So we accept that our people must be subjected to all sorts of competency assessments that don't apply to Europeans coming in, on, into the continent. We accept that as African, as, as African HR professionals. So I think we also need to become a different breed of HR professionals. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that we become militant, and, but stand up for what you believe in. Don't just turn a blind eye and say, oh, well, you know, I have to keep my job. There's a lot that is happening that is not moving us forward as a continent. And HR professionals are at the center of some of those things. I think that's such a true comment. And also in terms of celebrating, I mean, if you look at how many South Africans have achieved significant success in the global arena, and we don't celebrate that enough, and we don't talk about that enough, you know, instead we worry about there's not enough, you know, there's not enough local skills and expertise. But if you look carefully, you know, there's, there's often gems hidden. Anike, I would just like to add my plea to my fellow South Africans is, again, to maintain to be open-minded. I have found in my history that when you are selling a position in rest of Africa, you really have to work very hard as an HR professional. When you're trying to say, here is a finance director position, you're going to be based in Ghana, and you've got the talent in South Africa, but the talent is not so keen. Mm. So I'm just pleading to all of us that are in this profession uh, that we should be open-minded and we should be encouraging more of us to have an appetite um, for the rest of Africa. Mm. I think we can easily be a lot more adventurous, Marge. Thank okay? you. There's so much to be gained. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to share just one sure. silly little joke about having to the bribe, and you get all of these. I mean, they also happen right in our backyard, so this is no surprise. Um, just my experience in 2006, first time in Lagos, uh, you actually have to pay for your trolley at the airport, your airport trolley, you actually have to pay for it, but I didn't know that. So I literally fought with the airport marshals <laughs> because I'm in Lagos and I'm ready for these guys. I've been prepped, I've been warned, and there I was having a fat argument and the guy just <laughs> did not have the energy for me and he let me go. And only as I exit the airport, I see a big fat note that says like 50 naira or something for the trolley. So there you go. <laughs> Uh, that's absolutely great, Larry. I, I think some of these Africa stories are, you know, are hilarious after the fact. But mm. the frustration when you are there and oh. you don't know what's happening, 
it's um, it's something else. Um, I wanted to also tell a story about one of my colleagues. So we arrived at the, the like there was a whole excom team uh, into a country and. So he's Lebanese and he's an expert into South Africa, so, but uh, we were traveling into another country. And the rest of us, we, they let us go through and he, they set him aside. And he was put in jail for three days. No charges. None of us knew why he was put in jail. And the streetwise part comes in there because somehow he managed to get himself a phone call in jail. He managed to call us. But you can imagine we are the friends we were all in trying to get our legal director to find a legal consultant in the country yeah. so we can find out how to release him. And he managed to negotiate his own exit and then said, guys, I'm on my way home. Um, while, we, while we're still trying to, to get him out because we didn't know why he's... And there was no reason. Why he was uh, why he was arrested, besides the fact that perhaps there was no fifty dollars in his <laughs> in his wallet. But that's I think for me the one advice I want to say is like, you know, Africans will always emphasize the word protocol, and protocol means some of these things that we're talking about for them is pro it's protocol, but also protocol in the office, you know. One of the things, you know, the overused word, but so meaningful as well, is Ubuntu. The humility you need to make yourself a success in Africa. Um, and for them, you know, like two months ago, we were in, um, in Kinshasa, and the guys were saying, but you can't do that because it's my role. And when you overstep your boundaries, you make me incompetent in the role that I need to play. And in some of these countries, they take it very, very seriously. I know as South Africans, we are empowered, right? We talk, we, you know, I see something I need to do, I just get on with it. But somewhere else, you kind of need to just let other people do what they need to do. So the challenge is just then getting them to do it as quickly as you want it done. Because, you know, priorities are, are different. But that learning um, is very, very important. And it's a, it becomes a leadership skill. So it's not just about now being an HR expert. But those kind of things are actually what makes you endearing. And then also welcome into the next country and the next role and the next opportunity because you get it. I think that's true. Respect is absolutely key. Well, <laughs> no, I didn't want to say anything, <laughs> so I'm actually fine. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we ask for some questions from the audience? Uh, but my question to you is, um, you know, there's this educational gaps. Um, how did you guys work around that? And, you know, how did it empower you or challenge you to, to, to become what you are today? You know, you're coming back with that knowledge to South Africa and to share it with us. But um, there's this thing that the education in other African countries is higher than our education. So I just want to understand, is it true? And how did it impact you in your careers there? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I, I wouldn't say, in my own opinion, I wouldn't say that um, it is better than, than, than where we are. I mean, I think we also have some fantastic um, educational institutions um, on the, on, on, in South Africa, right? Um, I think what we need to change, as particularly as South Africans, is making African university fashionable to our own people. So everybody wants to go to Harvard, right? I also want to go to Harvard, by the way, just so we are clear. <laughs> but when are we going to find it sexy and fashionable to go to Makerere University, right? I don't think anybody here wants to go there. So it's not that it's better. It's acknowledging that it exists, right? And perhaps, um, I know that Zim used to have one of the best uh, um, educational systems uh, on the continent. And that is why you see a lot of um, Zimbabweans in the country who are very highly educated, um, but who've had to come here for, for, for political reasons. It's not that it's better, and I don't want us to start putting things on a, on a, on a scale in that, in that sense. It's how we use the education that we get and how maybe other Africans use the education that they get. Yeah. Particularly if I, if I look at my Nigerian colleagues um, that I've worked with um, and the fact that 
they might not be as highly, as, as highly educated as, as we are, but they travel. Within the continent, by the way, I'm not talking going to Europe, within the continent, so they are much more exposed to other type of education than the classroom education that we put so much uh, value on. Mm -hmm. But in terms of bringing all of that knowledge, um, the second part of your question, to South Africa, um, I know it's something that we all have to do. When you've been out there, you must come back and you must make sure that you, 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 you empower um, South Africans. So I personally do um, um, a great development program in my own capacity because I saw how Africans are not going to European countries or to the, to the States for that matter, not because they are not smart and they are not intelligent, but because we simply are not exposed to what is happening out there and we don't have that uh, confidence that Marge was talking about in ourselves as Africans. I think just from my side, um, I, I often found in the rest of Africa there's the hunger for more learning, further learning, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen in our country, but I think we take a lot of that for granted. Whereas in the rest of Africa, there's a hunger, a yearning to continue. So for continuous learning, um, and also because I think for me, you can have the education that you have, but it's really about what you do with that education that's going to count more. So for example, I work for a pay TV company, and I would have, for example, in Botswana, I would have uh, applicants that have an MBA that are applying for a call center position. So this person is applying because they're seeing it as a foot in the door, um, where I think a typical South African would be absolutely not, would never consider that opportunity. So for me, the bigger lesson has been more, and what I've learned from the rest of Africa, is that use what you have, and it really counts. It's all about how you're using what you have, and not necessarily about acquiring, mm -hmm. basically. So, so that's what I can share. Um, and then in as far as imparting back, I'm very passionate about the rest of Africa. So whenever I have opportunities, I'm always talking about the rest of Africa. I'm always saying and challenging friends, people, colleagues, why are you not thinking about the rest of Africa? Good. Next. Hi. Um, I'm Namfunde from Swaziland, and I think that I'm actually excited about what you've spoken about, which I believe at this point I'm able to actually um, give a perspective as a recipient, you know, and, and to emphasize that what you're talking about is true. Now, I think um, as, a, as, as a, anybody or as an expatriate prepared to go into other countries, nothing is more significant than authentic leadership. Um, I, I know um, from, from, you know, working for a multinational company as well. You, we know from the onset whether we'll be working with this expert or not. And the power of the, lo of, 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 of the locals, if I may use that word, to be able to make you succeed in the mandate that you have been given by, um, by center or whatever headquarters is really, really significant. Um, and then I also wanted to touch base on the fact that there is a big change around moving around countries that's happening, if you would have realized. And I was hoping that you are going to touch on it, around countries becoming more, um, more stringent in the use of regulators um, and, and, and what that impact you are finding to be. Because I find that where previously we were having a lot of people coming into different countries, um, suddenly the regulators in the different countries, in the various countries, have, have woken up to put pressure or demand around a skills sharing. Um, and I think that's right. It's about time that we as Africans woke up. Because um, I've also experienced like the tightening of, let's say, the visas uh, in, in South Africa. You know, we used to have a general work skills visa, which was very easy to get. Now they're saying, what about those other thousands of people who are not, who are not employed? At what point are you going to give them opportunities? Um, so yes, so, and uh, Klebile made this point earlier. Bring people in when you need them, not just because you feel like it, or because they are born in their country and they want to experience uh, uh, South, South Africa. So it's right that they're, they're, doing, they're doing that, you know? So, but all, for us also as uh, HR uh, people, I know especially when people want to have intra-company visas, that's an easy visa for people to get. 
but it's your responsibility as well to make sure that that person meets the requirements. So if they are not uh, going, coming in for a, on a project, they are not coming to train somebody, absolutely refuse for that visa. Say that's not the visa they need to be applying for. Either then they apply for the general work skills visa or they apply for the um, critical skills visa. So that then they, you check that they meet the requirements. Because for me, I know I absolutely refuse because for me, one, we are lying to the government and I don't want that relationship with the government. And if we're ever audited, I don't want to compromise everyone else yeah. who's got a visa because of you. Yeah. And thirdly, I don't want to be in a South African prison or get fined because I've done something that I know I shouldn't have done. I think another way to work around the intro uh, permits and visas is I know in, in my previous law firm that I worked for, so there'd always be a direct swap. So if I've got a lawyer from, who's leaving Johannesburg and going to Nairobi office, then I'd ha equally have same level lawyer leaving Nairobi and coming into Johannesburg. So in that way, you're almost guaranteed that it's a direct swap. And what both individuals have learned on this secondment is you know, interchange, interchangeable. Um, and then there is that cross-referencing and there is a cross-development as well. I think there's a bigger uh, political um, yeah. or government conversation that needs to happen, actually, because, you know, you do get requests. We need to bring people in, and those visas are sometimes approved, even though it's not a critical um, skills visa. So there is a little bit of, um, I, th I don't know whether the HR function wants to take on that role of really, you know, lobbying government about how we manage bringing people into the country. There are certain roles that we do bring people in, but we've got plenty of skills um, of, of people on the continent that can actually do that. I think we are also much more accepting of people from outside the continent coming in than if you are getting a Nigerian into South Africa or you're getting a Rwandese into South Africa. We would rather have someone coming from Germany. I, I, I don't know when we are going to get over that and start accepting that perhaps local first, I think that's a phrase um, that's being used at work right now. Can we prioritize Africans first for the roles? And where we really need a skill that's coming from outside the continent, let's, let's be confident that that is what we need at that time. But I do think that we're not really playing um, that role well. Some people do it you know, better than others. But as, as HR professionals, it's something that we really need to take seriously and, and stop complaining that, oh, you know, the government is not doing anything. But you are the one that's processing and sending these forms to the government. So surely it's going to come back and it's going to be approved. And then we sit and then we complain. And there's been a as HR of, um, officials, things don't happen to us. We are part of the decision making. Yeah. So how does someone come into your company without you having input uh, into who this person is, what project is this, how did it come about? You, you know you can stop the bus, so stop the bus and get the right answers. And if you're not comfortable, I know we can't always have our way, but do try to do your job. And your job, I know for me, I'm saying my job is not to agree with my boss. My job is to show my boss the other way of where he should, the other perspective that he should be considering things. Uh, San Monani, good afternoon everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. So a disclaimer, I am not in the HR space. I'm actually an economist, but uh, HR for me is one of the entry points for economists because you guys work with people, you bring people in, all of that. So um, it's been quite nice to be in this environment. but. I do really believe that um, as South Africa, we have a lot to give to the rest of um, Africa. And in one of those spaces, which even within South Africa, we still haven't woken up to um, that realization is within the field of ergonomics. Internationally, it's one of the you know, um, disciplines which you know, it's taken really seriously, it's legislated and whatnot, and we're moving towards that here. But what I'm really interested in, because that's the, I mean, I want to take over that space in, uh, in Africa when it comes to ergonomics, is there a need um, currently? Have you seen that as HR practitioners within the rest of Africa that they are actually saying, hey, we need these skills? Um, so I've seen within the railway space that they do because in a lot of areas they're trying to revive the railway environment and they need this kind of skill. But in other industries, have you seen any of that? Is there a need? Are they hungry for us and we just don't know? Thank you. 
I, I think there is, um, but it also depends on the industry and the company that you're in mm. um, for you to get to know then the inside, the inside info because that's really what it is. But for, for example, I know, you know, every time because I, I fall under an EMEA or MINET region, whatever yeah. abbreviation your company has given it, that even when I'm in with my other colleagues from Middle East and uh, Europe, that what we know as Africans is actually oftentimes actually a little bit more advanced than what they, fo they focus on. Um, so the opportunities are even wider than, than Africa. But sometimes you wouldn't really get to know unless if perhaps then you are in touch with what's happening um, in uh, Career Stream 4 or what companies are advertising or you've got some ins inside information. But I know companies are always trying to open up in other countries and it does, often doesn't work out as well and then they have to shut down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that, that uh, exploration of knowing which one, which, which is the hot country now. You know, at some point it was Nigeria and then it contracted. Then it was Kenya, then it contracted. Um, so it's just about keeping up with the political and the socio-economic uh, uh, trends also in those countries. Yeah, it's also important to just note, I mean, change is a constant. So, and especially if you're going to be in the rest of Africa's space, I think you have to be open-minded to that. Uh, so that when there are opportunities that are talking to you, that you, you also keep an open mind to that opportunity. And it would be imp equally important that you do your homework about that opportunity um, so that you know exactly what you think you're getting yourself into. And I think opening up also the communication channel, speak to people that are in similar industries that you're keen on, um, and that should kind of make the, the workload much lighter for you in as far as making a decision. Thanks. No, so there's a questions. question there, and then I think there's another question at the back after that. Okay. Um, I'm really curious to hear from the team with regards to the, um, the labor laws within the different, um, I suppose, the other African countries. Um, what Did you guys find any challenges in the nuances, in the differences? Did you ever find yourself in a fix where you missed something from the... So if you are an HR practitioner looking to you know, look for a job um, to be working within some of the other African countries, what would the advice be from the labor laws perspective? I think we're fortunate coming from South Africa and the extent of our labor laws are more advanced than in the rest of Africa. So you're already starting from, you're already a step ahead in as far as what we locally have in South Africa. Um, you will find in some countries, West versus East, some are more documented, others are not so documented. So the best for me personally, um, how I've navigated through the IR issues is to really use what I have and know locally in South Africa, because that's already in an advanced stage and then kind of get the nuance of, of how to localize uh, particular policies. Equally, there are policies that I didn't have in South Africa that exist in the rest of Africa. For example, like a food policy seems to be quite important and essential in the rest of Africa, which is not necessarily in South Africa. Yeah. So you already are a step ahead because of our South Africa labor law. Yeah. I think uh, in my experience, the, the Southern African countries it's almost very easy to work because the, the labor law is very much similar to South African labor law. I mean, I currently have a case in Swaziland. The, pro, the, the, the processes and, and the institutions are very similar to South Africa. Um, the higher up you go, challenges are there's either no law covering a specific issue um, and it's based on memory you know this is how we've done things and this is how we've done things um, interestingly in Kenya I was talking to Bali um, the sick leave is what 180 days I think it's 180 days paid I almost fell, you know fell off my chair I was like what so I can have someone who's not working for half of the year and I have to pay them. So mm. there are those things that you are going to come across and you need to be aware and you need to yeah. understand that it doesn't mean that there's nothing. There yes. is something. It might shock you, but it's there. So learn how to work with it. And as Marge says, where it, it doesn't exist, always fall back to um, um, South African law if you really cannot find um, um, any help um, in the country where, 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 where you are in. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
that that's been my my experience i haven't been in in, in problems but i think mm. the one thing i want to call out is around safety safety legislation i think south africa has by far the most advanced um on the continent if you go to drc where i have a lot of experience it's shocking how people work in the factory with no protective equipment and it's okay uh, how they climb on the trucks and they do whatever on the roads and they die fatalities every year and it's okay so those are some of the challenges that you are likely to come across i know everyone's keen for a drink so i'll be brief i'm an associate of the global career company who over the past 15 years has repatriated over 6,000 african professionals skilled uh, skilled people living in the living outside of africa so my question to the panel is how much are you spending time sourcing mid to senior hires in uh, in the african diaspora can you repeat the uh, question yeah, here yes a how much are you looking at so, so it's bit. getting noisy now but how yeah. so the emphasis is not on expatriates we yeah. know that they get homesick they're expensive with respect to expatriates going into these markets how much are you repatriating locals, as in Nigerians working in London or French speakers in Paris? That's what we specialize in helping HRDs like yourselves to repatriate skilled uh, mid to senior hires into Africa. So how much are you looking into that, into the diaspora and sourcing mm -hmm. talent there? Um, so with my previous company, um, I think they, they, they did that very well through um, the Global Careers Company, um, going to summits in London, in Paris, in New York, um, to reach out to Africans who are living out in the diaspora. Because I do think that we have a lot of people that are looking to come back home, but you know, having lived in Europe, it's really nice <laughs> to live there, everything works. So you really have to go and find people and, 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 and convince them that they are coming home to a job, to an opportunity. Nobody wants to come and start you know, looking for a job by themselves. So I do know that the Global Careers Company has been very um, uh, good actually in, in, in helping companies bring back uh, Africans from the diaspora. With my current employer, uh, we, 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 we don't have a lot of um, experts in any case to begin with and we do really focus on hiring locals in, in all of the countries uh, where, where, where we operate. I find it's easier to attract um, them to come back, especially if maybe they've been in the same company and now they can come back, at least then their knowledge of the company is sound. And all they have to now do is re-emphasize, um, just re-engage themselves within the country. But what, what's also important for us to have is making sure you've got proper expatriate uh, policies in place, because that's also what then becomes attractive. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with a few experts who, even when coming back to their country, they don't want to come back on local packages. They want to come back in on expatriate packages, and which then makes it a challenge. Because now I can't afford to pay you in, in dollars or in euros when you, should, you are coming into a local role, which then should be paid in Naira, for example. The challenge that I experienced in the legal fraternity is essentially if you're now going to practice locally, then you have to write exams, rewrite, and register. Um, so that tends to be what puts a lot of the legal uh, professionals off in as far as repatriating back home. Hi, everyone. Well, Mike's quick. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Bali Ndabeni from Mondelez. Um, I just wanted to ask on um, talent management and, and, and retention um, when you look at um, countries outside South Africa. Um, what speaks to talent out there? What, what motivates them? What keeps them engaged? Is it a similar strategies that we will apply um, in South Africa or um, how do we customize our, our, our approach uh, for the countries outside South Africa? Okay. I think it's, it's different depending on the, the basis that you're starting off from. You know, in countries where you know that um, skills levels are, are really at the basic level, then talent retention becomes very key. Because now you know, um, if you lose this person, 
start recruiting is going to be a difficult task and then also then training them to get up to skill is also going to be a tough a tough thing so then once you've identified who those people are holding on to them becomes completely imperative whereas in other instances uh, it's it's much easier and also depending on your whole organization and your structure your um, how big you are, how wide or global you are, and how easy then it is for us to just move other people in. But at some, in some countries I find it's, it's okay, um, you can lose people and replace them much easily, but where you know that retention is key, you, you cannot ever sleep on the job on that. Mm. I was very fortunate in the, sorry, in the telecoms and the TV type industry um, because the company was very smart in making sure that you don't want to leave. So I, we didn't struggle much in as far as uh, retention of talent um, because you made sure that you put whatever was necessary that, uh, so that individuals with all that institutional knowledge, especially our technical staff members, that you know, they are working in an environment that's already providing cutting edge technology. Um, so it's incredibly difficult for them to even think about working for another organization because it's not going to compare in as far as the exposure that they have to upgraded technology. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all yeah, approach yeah. to talent management. Yeah. As we started talking earlier and we said that the continent is so diverse. Mm. Um, for instance, in my experience, if I, when, when I worked uh, for my former employer, Nigeria, they have these amazing financial benefits mm -hmm. and when you talk to them that's what keeps them um, in, in, in the company that, that, that I was working for. I mean there's driver allowance, there's electricity allowance, uh, load shedding allowance, mugging allowance, if you get mugged the company pays. So there's a lot that the company is built that talks to that particular environment whereas in South Africa you know that not a lot of us will stay for just for money, right? Mm. We want the opportunities to advance. We want the opportunities to become a, a senior people in our organizations. Um, but if you go to Burundi, for instance, where there's one or two, I mean, the, I think the other biggest employer is the government and then the other one is Heineken, people are not going to move anywhere. So as long as they are well taken care of, they are paid well, they are provided for that by the company, they will stay. So you need to look, if you go to Kenya, for instance, yeah. where there's a lot of multinationals that have set up the African headquarters in Kenya, competition for talent is much higher, mm. and therefore you need to really build your talent strategy to make sure that you provide uh, opportunities for advancement, you provide job security, you provide uh, a good uh, uh, compensation packages. So it really is different de depending on, 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 on where you are. Where people have a lot more choice, then your talent management strategy needs to be a little bit more sophisticated than in countries where you are the big, large giant and whatever you give, people are happy with. Very good. Thank you. Um, thank, you. thank you for the opportunity and I'm going to be very, very quick. So as an independent consultant, I found myself working on a project um, similar to talent management. This particular organization has regions or branches in other African countries and we had to assess them and what I found and I know a lot of literature may go against it but you have CEOs heads of business that were performing terribly from a psychometric and um, simulation perspective on general management on how they could lead projects and for me I thought it should it could have been a language thing but the biggest question that I have for you is when you are undergoing a talent management process and you do decide on a certain battery or an assessment that you'd like everyone to go through so that you can compare apples with apples, do you take into consideration that yes, in Nigeria or yes, in Kenya, English is not necessarily you know, a language that they talk all the time and therefore it can impact the assessments and let's be real, South African companies we use a lot of American, um, US developed assessments and this does impact um, assessments. So I just would like to know what type of strategies you, you basically use in your organizations when you mm. undergo these, these, these um, 
Project. So I, I recently had um, I recently worked on a graduate development program, right? And one of the challenges that the company was facing was, despite the fact that in 2015 they received 22,000 applications for the global program, right? 11,000 of those came from Nigeria, out of the 22,000. But by the time the 15 was selected, there was not a single African. One of the big problems was the assessment that was being used, that you know was not fit for our context as Africans. Um, the assessment centers that were being used were being run by you know typical middle-aged European males who don't understand that if I don't look at you in the face, it doesn't mean that I lack confidence. It's probably my upbringing as a, as a, as a black woman. Um, those of you who know, you don't look, first of all, you don't look a man in the eyes. I don't know why. Um, but if someone is older than you, you also don't look at them in the eye. You don't address them in a certain way. So one of the things that was a problem was the assessment. Because we take whatever that we've used in South Africa or whatever that we've used in Europe and we apply it here and we think it's going to work. It goes for your management practices as well. We have very well established African ways of managing, of conflict manage, uh, management, but somehow we forget that and we want to adopt things that yeah. don't really quite work. So I, I don't have an answer for you that says this is the tool that you can use. Yeah. But you have to always be mindful that that tool might not work, no, not only because of language, but because of culture, depending on what type of, of assessment tool that you use. Mm -hmm. So if your company has a strategy and that is part of what is used to assess competence or to assess talents, you know, there's not much you can do, but always have it at the back of your mind that this is not necessarily going to work the same way that it works in South Africa because we are different from a cultural perspective and not so much even from a language perspective because you can always translate them, right? And they still don't work. I've had them translated to French, to Portuguese, and they still didn't work. It, it really had to do with, with, with culture and exposure of people to these things. My preference, I don't use them. Thank you. For exactly everything yeah. that you said, it's, they're useless. So don't. The decision you're trying to make is not, you're not going to get the information you need from them. So don't use them. And just to give you an example, I mean, in a consulting firm I was working in, and this were internal candidates, and it was not even psychometrics. These guys are now applying to be partners. They're on the partner track, and now they're putting in their business cases on why me? And, you know, oh, the, even the senior partners are now trying to say, why this person? And even then, we struggled so much with getting those business cases into the South African standard of what we want to understand in them. So it's not like any, in any way that people are going to get or to get, give you what you want to hear in a way that you want to hear it. It's not going to happen, so don't, don't even go there. I think just from my end, um, and I'm a trained psychometrist, and for whatever reason, I'm always saying, please don't, please don't, because the trap that we HR professionals will fall under is you want to use psychometrics as the sole uh, decision-making criteria, and, and that's where we fall flat. So that's why you're having the challenges that you're having, because you're now leaving it to a battery of some sort that's going to determine on paper whether or not this person is going to be successful in the job.